Matthew chapter 1. It's like the Messiah's family tree, isn't it? You know, maybe you've been caught up in it. There's a current fad to get your DNA tested so that you can discover your ancestry. Sounds interesting. I'm not necessarily against it, but I'm telling you one thing. It's much more important to me to know where I'm headed than where I came from. And uh, I'm more concerned about my spiritual identity in Christ than I am about my biological identity, even though that's a curiosity. I get it. I understand it. But here in Matthew chapter 1, we may have an exception. We may have an exception about biological ancestry being so important because this ancestry of this person, Jesus of Nazareth, a historic person, human being, is really tied to his claim to be the Messiah. And so that's what we want to look at. I find the chapter very easily divided this way. The first 17 verses are about his ancestry, Messiah's ancestry. Verses 18 to 25, that's about nativity, Messiah's nativity, his birth. So we'll look at it that way, but, a, but we will do so after we pray. Once again, Heavenly Father, we pause to bow to you because we're constantly reminded just how much we need you and how that nothing can be accomplished without your spirit working. You must not only anoint the speaker, but you must, Spirit of God, anoint the listener. That there might be that uh, connection. And that, again, your word would have such deep penetration into the soul and spirit and thus work that transforming change that you alone can do in the spiritual heart of people. And we pray that this will happen all to the exaltation and magnification of the Lord Jesus. It's in his name that we pray this. Amen. So let's begin by looking at his ancestry in the first uh, 17 verses. And uh, of course, need I remind you that a genealogy is very important to Jewish people to prove their tribal identity. Because to prove your tribal identity as a Jewish person involves your right then to a certain inheritance. And so it's, ne it's necessary for anyone that claims to be Messiah to prove that you are a direct descendant of King David because it was to King David that God promised that he would bring the Messiah from and would establish through the Messiah a son of David, a descendant of David, a kingdom that will never end, an eternal kingdom. And so very important that the Messiah also be seen as the son of David. And Matthew, of course, written to Jewish people predominantly, presents the family tree of Jesus of Nazareth, but he presents it through his legally adopted father, Joseph. And in doing so, he reveals the Messiah's true identity that establishes Jesus' rights to David's throne. And I might say this, currently, Messiah Jesus is the only person that is able to prove the right to the throne of David through a genealogical record because all the other Jewish records of genealogy that would establish this had been destroyed by the Romans in AD 70 when the temple was destroyed. So this is very important that the Holy Spirit of God has seen fit to inspire Matthew as he did to include this genealogical record of Jesus of Nazareth, Israel's Messiah. 
And I want you to see, as we look at this ancestry, I want you to see it first of all from a historical standpoint. What this ancestry reveals in the first 17 verses, it reveals that Messiah, Jesus, is part of human history. He is part of all Jewish history, but he is, in a larger sense, part of human history that prepares the way for the Messiah's birth, this history. And what you see is God providentially ruling and overruling to fulfill the promise that he began to make. What's the first promise of, of a Messiah, of a Redeemer in the Bible? You should know this. Genesis 3.15. Very good. Some of you got it. That's the first reference to a messianic redeemer. God speaking to the serpent who deceived Eve into eating that forbidden fruit, whatever it was. He said, through her seed, I will crush the head of the serpent and the serpent will bruise her seeds heal. That's the first indication of Messiah Jesus being sent into this world. And as you continue reading in the book of Genesis, you get to chapter 22 and verse 18, it becomes very clear that this, this Redeemer, this Messiah, is a son of Abraham. He comes through Abraham. And then, when you get to chapter 49 of Genesis and verse 10, you are then given another window and you see a telescoping uh, truth growing. And now we are told that this one not only comes out of Abraham's seed, but specifically he comes through the Jewish people and specifically one tribe of those 12 tribes and that being the tribe of Judah. And as we continue on, you get to 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verses uh, 12 and 13 and you know what we're told there? That the Messiah that is promised first in Genesis 3.15 that will come through Abraham, that will come through the tribe of Judah, the Jewish people, will also come through David. And there is a promise that God gives King David in 2 Samuel 7 that says that his kingdom, his dynasty, will last forever. Well, is the kingdom of, of David is it uh, in existence today? Well, in one sense, no, but in another sense, yes. Because it's going to have a resurgence. It's going to be resurrected. And it's going to be resurrected in Messiah Jesus. And so all of this, the scripture, and, and so what we have here in this ancestry, the family tree in the first 17 verses of Jesus of Nazareth, who is Israel's Messiah, all of this is, accomplishes God's purpose to bring his son into this world. And listen what the prophet says about his son. Listen to this. Behold, God says, my servant, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled. He shall be very high. As many as were astonished at the, his visage is, is so marred more than any man. That is a prophetic reference to what happened at Calvary on the tree. But then look at what springs from that. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him when he comes the second time. For that which they had been told them shall they see. And then it goes into that wonderful 53rd chapter that we're probably more familiar with. That's the thing. That's what this is about. That's why this chapter is in Matthew chapter 1. Because it is a revelation of the accomplishment of God's purpose to bring his son, the Redeemer, the Messiah, into the world Christ Jesus came into the world to what? 
save sinners. That's exactly what is behind this ancestry in this portion of the scripture this morning that we're looking at. Now, Matthew, and this is important that you understand this, Matthew traces Joseph's, Jesus' legal adopted father, Matthew traces Joseph's lineage through David's son Solomon. I don't know if you're aware of it, but there's another genealogy of Jesus in Luke chapter 3. And the difference is this. While Matthew traces Jesus' lineage through Joseph, the son of David, Luke traces Mary's lineage through Nathan, another son of David, not Solomon, but through Nathan. So that Jesus is clearly a son of David. He is a son of David through his adopted father, Joseph, and he is a son of David through his physical existence that comes through Miriam. Her Hebrew name would be Miriam, his mother. And if you read the Gospels, when you see him perhaps coming into a village and there is a blind man or a deaf man or, uh, or uh, a lame person that wants healing and they cry out and they say, Jesus, Yeshua, son of David, have mercy on me. What they're saying is, I believe you're the Messiah. I believe you are the, the son of David that was promised in the scripture. That's exactly what's going on there. And you'll find that several times. Drop down to verse 17. In verse 17, which I've read uh, with you already this morning, it talks about three fourteens, right? There is 14 generations, it says, from Abraham to David. Then there is 14 generations from David until the Babylonian captivity. And then there are 14 generations from the return from Babylon to Jesus, the Messiah. Three fourteens equals what? 42, okay? So 42 generations of people. Now, mind you, there, are, there is a deliberate omission of some names in this genealogy, and I think, I don't know why, but I think it's to give systematic, uh, he wants to systematically summarize three periods of Israelite history, each with 14 generations. There is a part of Judaism that uh, believes in gematria, and gematria is uh, simply taking the Hebrew letters, consonants, and giving them a number value. For example, the name David, the name David, if you take the three consonants, there were not uh, vowels in the, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, only consonants, you take the three uh, consonants that make up the name David, a Dalit, a Vav, and a Dalit. A Dalit is four. A Vav is six, numerical value. And of course, the other Dalit, four. So you have a total of 14. I'm not sure, but uh, he's writing to Jewish people. So there might be something to the fact that he does the 14, and David's name adds up to 14. I think it could be just an emphasis of the royal connection, the Davidic connection, that Jesus is the son of David just by going through the generations as he does here. So there's a historical tie. There's a numerical tie. Thirdly, there is what I call a merciful connection here. And I want you to see it with me in three verses. Look at verse 3. It says that uh, Judah begat Pharaoh and Zerah of Tamar. See that? Tamar is a woman. 
drop down with me also in the fifth verse. And uh, it says, And Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. Rahab, another woman. And then it says in that fifth verse, And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. Obviously, we know who Ruth is, another woman. And then verse 6, And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah, which is Bathsheba. So sh her name isn't mentioned, but she certainly is, uh, is implied there in that sixth verse. What I'm saying is this. The names in this ancestry, in this family tree, are all men except for these four women. Because in Jewish law, unlike modern Judaism, in uh, the, the Jewish scriptures, ancestry was traced through the father and not through the mother. And so as a result, it's just really unusual that you have a reference in these verses to four different women. And by the way, all of these four women have questionable backgrounds, don't they? If you know anything about the story. Uh, two of them practiced prostitution. Uh, two of them were also Gentiles as well, pagan Gentiles. One of them was an adulterer or an adulteress, I should say. I'm sure that those are things that the Jewish people would love to forget about. But I think it reveals the fact that God mercifully includes in redemption in his plan these kind of people. People that are clearly sinful people, that have been involved in outright sin, caught red-handed, and also Gentiles, pagan Gentiles as well. I think it perhaps may also, and I, I don't know this, but I'm thinking about this, maybe it's preparing the way for Miriam, we call her Mary, Miriam's prominence uh, that will culminate, of course, in the line of Messiah, and it would tend to humble and hush up her false accusers because look at the skeletons that are already in your closet, right? I did want to point out Ruth. I want you to see that in the fifth verse, Ruth. Because today, the Jewish people are celebrating Shavuot. Shavuot. And as a result of that, they will read in the synagogue the book of Ruth. They believe that uh, that, that took place during the, the, the time of the celebration of Shavuot, which we call Pentecost. By the way, the Jewish people traditionally believe that it was at uh, Shavuot that God gave Moses the law on Mount Sinai. Well, that was really the wedding of God and his people. That was a wedding ceremony, you might say, under, under the hoopah there on Mount, Sin, uh, on Mount Sinai. And we know how Boaz, a Jewish man, was wedded to a formerly pagan Gentile woman, Ruth. And I think it's very interesting because Shavuos is also the time when the Holy Spirit descended in Acts chapter 2 and he did so not only to fill believers with his spirit but also to bring Jew and Gentile together as his bride, right? And so I felt it was fitting that we should make that connection because of Ruth's name here in Matthew chapter 1 and this being uh, that very celebration. Paul says it this way, he has taken two that were formerly enemies and he has made them one new man. He's made them his bride, right? So merciful. But there's a, a 
there is something that I believe is very critical in this ancestry, and I clearly don't want you to miss this. So wake up and listen to this one. Okay, you ready? Chapter one, verse sixteen. It says, and and look at how look at how it reads. I mean, all the way down uh, from verse two down to verse sixteen, you'll find over and over again that this man begat this man as his son. This man begat this man as his son. Get to verse 16, and look at it changes a little. And Jacob begat Joseph. That's the adopted legal father of Jesus. Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, and notice it says, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Messiah, who is called, this is critical. This is an implication of the virgin birth because what it's saying is not that Joseph begat Jesus. It had nothing to do with Joseph at all, but rather the conception was her seed, the seed of the woman. Genesis 3.15, it was her seed. It says, of whom, and that, uh, that phrase, of whom, is in a feminine tense. It's a feminine tense, which means it cannot, it cannot, it is not referring to Joseph. It's referring to, to Miriam. He was clearly conceived from the seed of a woman, which is totally unnatural, which is supernatural. Joseph is simply the legal father of Jesus. It is through Joseph in Matthew 1 that Jesus is shown to be a son of David but G and have uh, the right to David's throne. And, uh, but Jesus was not a physical descendant of Joseph. That's very important because, incidentally, uh, there is a particular king that is mentioned in verse 11, Jeconias, who, according to Jeremiah 22, verse 30, had a curse placed upon him, and none of his offspring was to ever sit on the throne of David. And they didn't. But Jesus didn't come through the physical descendancy of uh, Jeconiah. He came through the physical descendancy of Mary, as Luke 3 brings out. So you see how specific, how inspired the Word of God is, how wonderful it is? All right. That's the ancestry, verses 1 to 17. The second part is what I call the nativity. And that is, it brings out in verses 18 to 25, the absolute unique birth of Jesus of Nazareth. It is a birth that is totally distinct from any other human birth that has ever taken place on this planet. You understand that from square one. This nativity is an absolutely unique birth. Now, look at with me verses 18 and 19. It says, now the birth of Jesus Messiah was on this wise, happened like this. When his mother Mary was espoused or betrothed to Jesus, or to Joseph rather, before they came together, before they had a physical relationship as husband and wife, she was found with child, notice, of the Holy Ghost. And then Joseph, her husband, being a... Uh, I'll, I'll save that, but I, I just want to look at verse 18 for a moment. Let me talk about this thing here called espousal, or betrothal, as it is referred to. There are two phases in first century Jewish Betrothal. And this is important for you to understand if you want to really understand what's going on here. And the first part of betrothal is the choosing. The choosing part. It was family-initiated arrangement of a marriage. Some of you that come from other countries than the United States of America, you know what it is to have your family arrange a marriage for you. Well, it involved the consent of both the 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 woman and the man as well, but it was a family thing, and it was a it was a family choice and uh, an arrangement that was initiated. The second phase of betrothal is what is called the contract, 
That is, there would then begin a negotiation of prenuptial agreement that would uh, be worked on between the two families. And it would, uh, it would involve how much, how much that, uh, that bridegroom and his father were going to have to put down to have the privilege of having their daughter as uh, his wife. And so there would be this uh, negotiation that would take place. And when it was all said and done, there was a contract that was as binding and really equal to marriage. In fact, from that point on, even though they didn't live together, they were termed husband and wife. It's very important to understand this, what's going on here. At that point, they were said to be husband and wife, but for approximately a year, they would live separately. The bridegroom would go back to his father's house and he would begin then to build onto his father's house a, a living space for his wife that he was going to bring there uh, approximately 12 months later. And uh, it was this time frame, during that one year time frame, that uh, Mary was found to be pregnant. And as a result of that, Joseph simply thought, as probably anyone would have thought, that she had been guilty of adultery. Instead of making a scene out of it, he is very deferential to her, which I will uh, share with you in, in just a moment, but this is clearly grounds for divorce. In fact, personally, it's my, it's my opinion, I can't say dogmatically, but it's my opinion that, the, that Matthew, being the only gospel that gives a grounds for divorce in Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 19, he says, except it be for fornication, I'm convinced that the word fornication refers to this happening during that betrothal period because that's what the period was for. That's what that one year waiting period was for, to prove her virginity, to prove her purity. And so I think that it's during that, uh, that, uh, that binding agreement called betrothal that then they had grounds to divorce if she's found out to be pregnant. Well, that's what's going on here. So there's betrothal, but there's a second part that I want you to see because this is probably the most important. And that is that this nativity not only involves betrothal, it happened in that period of time, but it involves the supernatural. And there is very clear in our uh, memory verses that we've been working on, uh, as Joseph thought on these things, an angel of the Lord, it says in verse 20, appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary to be your wife. Don't be afraid to go through with the wedding at the end of that waiting period. For that which is conceived in her, listen, is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. Uh, so on. Virgin shall be with child. Right? Bring forth a son, and uh, they shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, what this is talking about is that this baby's birth, that we know now as Jesus, who was termed Jesus of Nazareth because that's where he was reared, we know from this passage that Jesus, the birth of this child, was an absolute miracle. It's not the way that babies are born normally. It's an absolute supernatural thing. This baby's conception is an absolute miracle. It's supernatural. And the, and the conception that uh, the angel tells Joseph about is that this child, like no other child, is the special creation of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember Genesis 1-2? 
The earth was without, without form and void. Darkness covered the face of the earth, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. You have darkness and the Spirit of God moving in a supernatural way upon the face of the, of the, of the waters, and creation comes forth. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 35, when the angel comes to Mary and says, Mary, you're chosen. You're going to have the privilege of bringing forth the Messiah. She said, how can this be? I, I've never had a physical relationship with any man. I'm a virgin. Here's what the angel tells her. The angel says, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. And the thing that will be born in you will be the Son of God. You see, the creative power of the Holy Spirit in Genesis 1-2 and the creative power of the Holy Spirit in Luke 1-35 or in Matthew chapter 1, it is the Spirit of God, the Creator Himself, that creates life. He creates spiritual life in the, in the human spirit. He creates physical life in this woman's physical womb. He can do that. He can raise the dead. What? This isn't a big deal. If he can raise the dead that have been dead for thousands of years, certainly he can create a baby in the womb. He's a creator. He's a great creator. It's supernatural. That's what it is. It's a virgin birth. In fact, it says in, in Matthew 1, and in that 23rd verse, which is part of your memory work, it says, a virgin shall... It's a quote from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. But the word for virgin here in Matthew 1, 23, is a word, listen to me, that in the original language, Greek language, that our New Testament was written in, that word never referred to a young woman. Always, only to a virgin. In fact, the Greeks built a building. And they called it the Parthenon. The word here for virgin is Parthenos. It's a virgin. And so, it's a supernatural birth that was anticipated. And that's why it's quoted in verse 23. It was anticipated by the prophet Isaiah. Another thing about this supernatural, not only conception, but supernatural in the area of salvation, our memory verse 21. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The, the, the name Jesus, Yeshua in Hebrew, is a contraction of the name Yeshua or Joshua, which means God is salvation. And so what uh, we are to see from this is the name Jesus is an emphasis on what Messiah will do, on what he does. He has come as Savior. He has come to deliver people from sin. What do saviors do? They're deliverers. What do we need to be delivered from? Israel needs to be delivered from. Gentile people need to be delivered from sin. He's not a savior unless you allow him to deliver you from sin. And when he delivers you from sin, it's a total deliverance. He delivers you from the penalty of sin, which is death and hell for all eternity. He delivers you from the power of sin, which enables you to live a holy and victorious life here and now. And one day he will deliver you from the very presence and possibility of ever sinning again when he comes for you. And he makes you he gives you a resurrection glorified body. He shall save his people from their sins. Israel, but anyone who he's the savior of the world is exactly what we're told. But he comes to deliver from sin. Hey, if you don't want to be delivered from sin, then you don't want a savior. If you don't think that you're a big enough sinner to need deliverance from sin, then this isn't for you. But if you are sinking 
under the guilt and load and burden of your sin, I have great news for you. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, Savior, for he shall save his people from their sins. You got sins that you need to be saved from? You got sins that you need to be delivered from? You have sin that has you in an iron grip that you're in bondage to? All of that can be broken through Jesus. He's the Savior. And then one other thing. In verse 23, this is supernatural. The conception, the fact that uh, of the salvation that he brings is a supernatural thing. No man can do that on his own. Jesus has to do it for us. Hey, if Jesus doesn't save us, if we can save ourselves, then his death on that tree was for nothing. It was unnecessary. That horrible death was unnecessary if we think we can do it on our own. Third thing about him being supernatural in these verses, verse 23, his identification. He's called Emmanuel. While salvation emphasizes what Jesus does, Emmanuel emphasizes who Jesus is. He is God. That's glorious. He's God. He's the God of glory. This little baby is really the God of glory that is masked like some of your faces. He's the God of glory. He is God with us. He's the God of grace. There's only one way that God can ever dwell with human beings, and that is on the basis of his grace. That is that we can't ever deserve. It can't be earned. It comes of his free will and love toward undeserving sinners. Emmanuel, God with us. Well, that brings us down really to the last two verses of this chapter. And I want to talk about the nativity and involve Joseph in this because basically 18 to 25 is all about his interaction with God's angel, God's messenger. And uh, I love the way that Joseph responds. In verses 24 and 25, look at it with me. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and he took unto him his wife, and he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus, exactly what he was told to call him. Call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So, the nativity here, you see betrothal, you see the supernatural, but I see in Joseph that, that he's very deferential. That is, he defers to God's will. He is willing to be part of God's plan despite the personal cost it was to him. And it was costly. It, no, notice that it says, if we can jump up a moment to verse 19, Joseph, her husband, being a just man. You know what a just man is? A moral man. He was a, a moral man. He would not have had anything to do with premarital uh, sex or fornication. He was, a more, he was a just man. He was an ethical man. He was a fair and reasonable man. He was a good man. He was just. He was living right according to the word of God, not only before God, but before men as well. He was a just man. He was a moral man, but also he was a mild man. Look at uh, verse 19 again. It says, he wasn't willing to make a public example of Mary, and so he determined to put her away privately. To, he was a mild, he was a, a, a tender, kind gentleman. And he chose to quietly divorce her rather than to publicly disgrace her and cause a scandal. Can you imagine the shock and the agonizing perplexity that would have gripped this man's thinking when he found out that his, his wife that he was betrothed to was pregnant. And he knew he wasn't the father. But he balanced, he balanced his justice with a wounded yet tender love. It reminds me of God. The Bible says in Psalm 8, 85 and verse 10 that God's 
truth and mercy are met together, that God's righteousness and, uh, and God's peace have kissed one another. God's both holy and yet at the same time he's loving. Here's a man that is right, he's just, he's moral, he wants to do the right thing, but at the same time, he is a compassionate, merciful, tender-hearted man. And so he, he determines he's going to do the right thing, but he's not going to, he's not going to make it miserable for her. He's a meek man. I read verses 24 and 25. There's where I really see Joseph's meekness. And by the way, do not ever, do not ever confuse meekness with weakness. He's a very strong man. He's a just man. But he's a meek man. And a meek man, I mean, he's a cooperative man. He cooperates with unquestioning submission to God and completely compliant to the Word of God. When God reveals to him in this special revelation through a dream, he doesn't hesitate. He completely complies with God's Word, God's revelation to him. And it says that he did not have a physical relationship with her even after he brought her into the home uh, that he constructed for them to live in as a married couple until she had brought forth this babe, Jesus. Which, by the way, does not mean that Mary was a perpetual virgin. It just means that they didn't have relations until after Jesus was born. Simple as that. Interesting, I, I made a comparison between the, the Old uh, Testament book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, as you, uh, if you will. The Old Testament begins with the generations of the world, but the New Testament here, Matthew 1, begins with the book of the generation of him who made the world. Messiah is Jewish. There's no doubt about it. He's a Jewish male. He's also the Son of God. He's miraculously conceived in David's lineage with all the rights to David's throne. What a story. I wonder how the cable news would spin this. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it wouldn't be straight. Let me tell you something. Years ago, when we had uh, when we had teams that would come here for weeks during the summer, Shalom mission teams, we would do various things with these young men and women. In the beginning, it was all young men, and I can remember one one year, we took them to Schneerson's grave. You know who Schneerson is? Yeah, he was a, a Lubavitch rabbi, rabbi that was highly revered by the Lubavitch as they thought the Messiah. And in fact, they still do. He's buried over in, in the area of Rosedale, Queens. But uh, we went over there, we saw his grave, and uh, there are Lubavitch there all the time. And you know what? Seriously, they're waiting for his resurrection. He's Messiah. Well, they, they're going to wait a long time. You know that there have been 50 plus messiahs in Jewish history, but none of them can prove that they're a messiah. None of them can, uh, uh, can, can pos possess the credentials to prove it, with one exception, and that's Messiah Jesus. By the way, I've also been in Israel to the garden tomb. And I understand, I understand that the garden tomb is probably not the location of the actual tomb of Jesus. And you know what? If they ever do actually find the real tomb of Jesus, I'll guarantee you it'll be empty also. No bones about it. <laughs> guarantee you that. Okay, I'm going to close with this and then we're done. So what does this have to do with you today in 2021? How does Jesus' credentials as Messiah, how does it impact you? Well, I want to tell you, no matter whether you're Jewish or Gentile, this is immensely important 
for us all in several ways, and I'm just uh, going to throw out three. I'm sure there's many more. Number one, Messiah Jesus is not only Israel's king, but he is the suffering servant that makes atonement for sin and is able to deliver all who receive him. He's the savior of the world. That impacts you because we all need a savior from sin. Second thing is this. Messiah Jesus is called the head of the church. He is the church's bridegroom who's coming for his bride, the church, to take her to his father's house and consummate this relationship. And the Bible says when he comes, it'll be sudden. And you won't have time to prepare ahead. you got to be prepared now. And you're not prepared. A lot of you aren't prepared. You're just floating along thinking everything's going to continue as it has. And you aren't prepared. And I'm telling you, Matthew 1 impacts you because this is who Jesus is. And no one can disprove. And it's real. And he's coming. And you need to be ready. And the third thing I want to say is this. Right now, Messiah Jesus is the resurrected Son of God. He's sitting on the throne of God. He's, he fills believers with his very life through the Holy Spirit and enables us with resurrection power to live the life here and now. Tell me that this Matthew 1 has nothing to do with you. You're living in a dream world. And you need a dream like Joseph to wake you up to the reality that time is running out on you. Time is running out on this world. You need a Savior. And this Savior is none other than the bridegroom of the church who's coming suddenly. And you need to be ready now. And you can be because His Spirit can give you resurrection life. That's powerful. And that's all I have to say to you today. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I do ask that you would continue to use the truth of Matthew 1, Messiah's credentials in our own hearts and lives, that we wouldn't just shrug it off, that it wouldn't be like water running off a duck's back, as they say, never penetrating anything. But Lord, may it impact us. May it hit us between the running lights, I pray. May it cause us to see that you're coming back suddenly for your bride and we need to be ready now and that we have a Savior who will live in us through his Spirit and give us Holy Spirit power and enablement to live a life that pleases you. Can't do it any other way. Thank you. You've covered all the bases, Lord, because you alone are the promised one. And we give you thanks for that.